With improvements and innovations in video camcorders, user-generated video sharing social networking sites like YouTube and technology in general, creating film has never been easier or more accessible for wider audiences. Within Northern Ireland, there is a strong community for film, whether it be through organisations like Northern Ireland Screen, film festivals, or groups or individuals making short films for pleasure. I met up with three filmmakers in Northern Ireland to discuss their use of representations on film, their achievements in filmmaking, and their love of film. I first met up with independent filmmaker George Clark. He is the director of the Kung Fu zombie movie Battle of the Bone, the most widely media-covered film ever made in Northern Ireland. George spoke about the problems he encountered with funding bodies due to films needing to include Northern Ireland's history of sectarian violence to gain funding. How it all started, obviously, with Battle of the Bone was that knockback from funding bodies that said, can't do this, so you can't... I, I honestly just wanted to make a kung fu movie. That was it. You know, a, a big martial arts movie set here. I do love zombies, obviously, uh, but when I was told... I, I couldn't get funding for these reasons, blah, blah, blah. And the whole Troubles statement about, you know, movies needed to be connected somehow to our, our history and stuff. I think I thought really hard about twisting that negativity around and, and making it a, a positive thing for me and, and thinking, how, how am I going to throw this back in their faces? How am I going to create something that they want, but yet has George Clark in it? Zombies have just always been a passion, a love for me. That You know, the, the thought of it happening kind of excites you as much as scares you. The feeling of having a, a real zombie attack, it's great. When you're running down the streets of Belfast with a hundred people covered in blood, you know, and you're running from them, it's fantastic. You know, you just don't do this kind of thing every day. And this country especially is not a starstruck country, but I think when people know they're gonna be involved in something like that, or it's just that, it's like, people when they go to church there's that big sort of feeling of you know everybody's happy 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 the same as being on a set with 100 or 200 people that are about to go and eat somebody it's that same feeling you just pumped you everybody's got that energy going and you know everybody wants to be a zombie in the likes of battle of the bone the zombies were, were there to represent that no matter what your problem is in life there's always something worse you know i think in today's society people tend to cry about the smallest wee thing. You know, they've all had a hard time of my job's terrible or, you know, oh, I'm not getting paid enough, blah, blah, blah. There's always something worse. The next person's always worse off. There's a bigger problem surrounding the whole world. And I think that was my main concern was there's nobody steps back and looks at the bigger picture. To, to make a film with such a statement that people need to step back and realize there is bigger issues and bigger problems out there, you need to, to bring that forward in that kind of a visual impact, such as Battle of the Bone, you know, yes, you've got the 12th of July, you've got the troubles kicking off, you've got Kung Fu, local banter, but yet when the zombies come in, everybody kind of then stops and wonders what the hell's going on because they've never seen this going on before. So as, as crazy and absurd and as, as daft the film is, there is strong elements and messages behind it all. Um, and I do, I think, eventually, as people grow up and maybe get a bit wiser and they look back on the film, they'll start to see what I've tried to say in it. You know, there was always two messages. One, there's bigger problems in the world. There's worse things out there. And here we are always fighting about the silliest wee things. Some of them don't even know what they're fighting about. But yet, there's always worse. So the zombies then obviously represented the bigger threat, you know, international terrorism, water taxes, whatever, and two, don't take drugs, because the zombies are created from drugs, you know. So, uh, I mean, yeah, but it, was, it wasn't so much about them being the sectarian motive, it was about them being bigger than that, being, being a worse problem than what we actually have. After speaking with George, he gave me contact details to get in touch with Noel and Roy Spence. The Spence brothers have been making films for over 40 years and have won international awards for filmmaking. They were kind enough to speak with me about their passion for filmmaking. Uh, when did your passion for filmmaking actually begin? I had said it began about 1952 when my mother took us, we were children about 8 or 9 year old, 
and she took us to the Ritz in Belfast to see Abbott and Costello meet Jack and the Beanstalk. We were totally engrossed, not only with the film itself, but with the whole cinema experience, walking in this huge big hall. And we were, being young children, you'd see everything larger than life anyhow. But this huge big hall and the kind of echoey, hollow sound coming from the screen and the film itself, just the whole experience. We probably didn't realise it at the time, but it, it grabbed us. We took a kind of a more academic interest in the old silent, surreal, expressionist yeah. films of the of the twenties, silent films, the famous ones like Nosferatu and Caligari. Although we were always <laughs> we were always for some reason more interested in the cheapies, the the great the, the B movies, uh, and Roger Corman was a big exponent of these films in the fifties. Uh, he made horror films, he recognised the market for the, the drive-in movies for the teenagers uh, and he produced these very low-budget films but very, very imaginative. We were perfect fodder for Roger Corman yeah. because he was making exactly the sort of stuff we wanted to see. Yeah. Stuff like Not of This Earth and Attack of the Crab Monsters. And Conquered the World. Conquered the World, yeah. that sort of stuff. Uh, firstly, how did you first uh, meet George Clark? I, he rang me and asked me if I would uh, premiere one of his films. It was the, the Boeing one. What's the name Battle of it? Battle of the Bone. Sorry? Battle of the Bone. Battle of the Bone, that was it. That was Battle speech. of the Bone, yes. He asked me if I would premiere it, and I said I would. And uh, he brought a fair audience down to see it. I mean, to me it was a bit uh, gory. Romero type uh, blood and entrails, and it's all a bit visceral, you know. He did well, but all, all I can say, it's not my sort of film, but I'm sure it has a lot of... Uh, supporters and a lot of fans. In your films, whether they're early ones or later ones, we use monsters. Did you ever try to have the monsters represent something? No. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a film, a film we did called Keep Watching the Skies. There's a big red blob-like monster in that. Now, uh, it actually won, it came number one, one of the 10 best awards. And at that time, people always wrote in that as a comment. And there were all sorts of stupid comments like, Somebody said this great red, unstoppable mass was the march of communism spreading over the Western world and all this, you know. And somebody else liked it too, Manchester United supporters, the Red Army and all, <laughs> all nonsense like. None of that was intentional. We were never politically motivated at all no. uh, or interested in, in uh, deep thinking. <laughs> we just enjoyed the entertainment side yeah. of things. There was nothing polemical or political at all about our films, they weren't, they weren't an attempt to say something about where we came from or the context we lived in. They were absolutely unrelated to that. So the blood answer to that is no. The monsters didn't represent anything other than just a bit of fun, really. We've never had any aspirations, you know, to uh, make films that are, are making large statements. You know, for us, they're entertainment. Uh, if they've got a good story and they entertain people for Whatever for twenty minutes or whatever it is, See, they're all shorts. We never made a feature film, but if if they entertain people for fifteen or twenty minutes and they say at the end, I really enjoyed that, then we're we're happy. I mean, we've never had any pretensions to say that these films are meaningful in a in a nationalistic kind of way or in any sort of political or uh, social way uh, or or symbolic way. We just are not interested in that. I mean, a lot, there's not a lot of hogwash talked about uh, the power of films to. Uh, to make political statements. I mean, I, we just don't, I'm not interested in it. We're never, never aware of it, and I'm sure we never will be. I'm, I'm sure I speak for both. Oh, absolutely. What are your opinions on Northern Ireland national cinema? If you see a film, what would make you know that's Northern Ireland? Well, it's a bit like every time you see a film in France, you see the Eiffel Tower and, and you hear an accordion playing. You know, I suppose every time you see a film in Ireland, you see the Giant's Causeway. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that kind of thing, or the City Hall. No, Odd, no. Man out. Odd Man Out. Odd Man Out. Odd Man Out. I always showed Albert Clark. Uh, he had a mobile Albert Clark, you know, which he wheeled around. And every shot, no matter where it was in the city, Albert Clark was in the back of it. Mm -hmm. it became ridiculous, you know. I can't really think of any Northern Ireland film which sort of bowled me over. The competition, the 10 best, mm -hmm. can you uh, tell me something about that? Because Roy's I'm a man to answer that one. Yeah. The, t the 10 best was run by a magazine called Movie Maker Magazine. And it was a worldwide competition. I, I personally won ten of them. It's, it's the top record. So I will get ten uh, awards, three of them gold and seven silver, all ten best winners. Uh, that has never been equaled. 
It was the Oscars of the independent or amateur. Film. It was, uh, it was. Uh, uh, it also gave us a chance to meet interesting people like Ray Harryhausen, mm -hmm. uh, who um, came over here and it was in our cinema. The Tudor and the. Sorry, how do you pronounce that? Excelsior. 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 Uh -huh. How did those actually come okay. to be? I started, I opened a cinema down there. It was an old hen house in 1974. I opened it with them, the big giant ants film, the classic from the 50s. It's named after the Tudor cinema in Bangor which we used to go to when I was at school. We used to nip off school and go to the Tudor and Bangor because it, it ran things like Beast of Hollow Mountain and Pharaoh's Curse and all the films we wanted to see. Um, and it's, it closed in 1962. And I told myself, if, when, not if, but when I come to build my own cinema, I'll call it the Tudor. And as I was showing you earlier, I got the original uh, double quad poster board from the Tudor and Bangor and I still have that. It's a proud possession. Every audience we have is a privately commissioned, commissioned show, show mm -hmm. and they come to see the film of their choice. They choose the programme. There aren't many cinemas will ring you up and say, what film do you want to see? So uh, they w choose the film, so they can't complain if they don't enjoy it. Also, they have, they have little bonus things they're not getting in an ordinary cinema. They have the, the fact that it's private and it's all their own friends. They can bring their own food and drink along. And there's no children. You know, which is a big bonus. It's an so, evening out, other than just a visit to the summer. Exactly. Yeah, it's so. a social occasion for them. And we also enjoyed the, the set building. I mean, this has also been an Irish cottage, a pub. It has been a graveyard, as Roy said. It's American been a, diner. It's been a 50s diner. It's been uh, somebody's front room. But as Noel says, this was a studio for building sets. So we turned it into the cinema. And it's called the Excelsior. One of, uh, and one of my favourite films, which is, uh, it came from outer space. Uh, there's an old mine shaft, there's a disused mine shaft called the Excelsior Mine. I thought that was a lovely name, so I called this the Excelsior Cinema. Partly because it sounds good and partly because it always conjures up fond memories of it came from outer space. We started to take a real interest in um, special effects, to use the term loosely, you know, Miniature uh, work. miniatures and tabletop stuff. And uh, we in fact produced a couple of uh, which we think uh, are very useful uh, training DVDs. One's called No Budget Special Effects and one's called No Budget Special Effects Makeup. And this is for people who want to do special effects and special effects makeup without having any money to spend on them. The two VD DVDs are based entirely on th tricks and effects we did ourselves. I had no regrets about having been born too soon to uh, have taking advantage of all the modern uh, technological advances there are in equipment. I mean, today the computer can produce the kind of effects we never could have produced, uh, but everybody can do that. If you buy the right piece of equipment, the right camera or the right computer or the right program, everybody can produce exactly the same effects. Ours are unique because they, uh, they were handmade that's the best way of putting mm -hmm. it. Home produced. If we want clouds are scudding over the moon, it's an artificial moon. The clouds are, are made, just to have one example, clouds are made by lighting a candle and smoking, holding a sheet of glass over the smoke and getting black smoke uh, over the glass. And then you draw that smoky glass across the camera lens, you know, over the false moon. And you get a lovely moon with clouds scudding over it. It's really well. There's something satisfying about starting with nothing and creating the effect by uh, whatever means you have at your disposal. After speaking with Roy and Noel Spence, as well as George Clark, I learned a great deal about their approaches and beliefs to filmmaking. I decided to create a short monster film of my own that would include elements of the filmmakers' approaches and beliefs to film. That looks like it came right out of a horror movie. Yep.
Um, not yet. I'm going to take a look around here. Jonathan! What is this? I don't, I don't know. Oh, God. Look at this. Let's go. It's eating itself. <laughs> 